Lindo Zhang, The Red Candle I once sacrificed my life to keep my parents' promise. This means nothing to you, because to you, promises mean nothing. A daughter can promise to come to dinner, but if she has a headache, if she has a traffic jam, if she wants to watch a favorite movie on TV, she no longer has a promise. I watched the same movie when you did not come. The American soldier promised us to come back and marry the girl. She is crying with a genuine feeling and he says, Promise, promise, honey sweetheart. My promise is as good as gold. Then he pushes her onto the bed, but he doesn't come back. His gold is like yours. It is only 14 carats. To Chinese people, 14 carats isn't real gold. Feel my bracelets. They must be 24 carats, pure, inside and out. It's too late to change you, but I'm telling you this because I worry about your baby. I worry that someday she will say, Thank you, grandmother, for the gold bracelet. I'll never forget you. But later, she will forget her promise. She will forget she had a grandmother. In the same war movie, the American soldier goes home and he falls to his knees asking another girl to marry him. And the girl's eyes run back and forth, so shy, as if she had never considered this before. And suddenly, her eyes look straight down and she knows now she loves him, so much she wants to cry. Yes, she says at last, and they marry forever. This was not my case. Instead, the village matchmaker came to my family when I was just two years old. No, nobody told me this. I remember it all. It was summertime, very hot and dusty outside, and I could hear cicadas crying in the yard. We were under some trees in our orchard. The servants and my brothers were picking pears high above me, and I was sitting in my mother's hot, sticky arms. I was waving my hand this way and that because in front of me floated a small bird with horns and colorful paper-thin wings. And then the paper bird flew away, and in front of me were two ladies. I remembered them because one lady made watery, sure, sure sounds. When I was older, I came to recognize this as a Peking accent, which sounds quite strange to Tai Yuan people's ears. The two ladies were looking at my face without talking. The lady with the watery voice had a painted face that was melting. The other lady had the dry face of an old tree trunk. She looked first at me, then at the painted lady. Of course, now I know the tree trunk lady was the old village matchmaker, and the other was Huang Tai Tai, the mother of the boy I would be forced to marry. No, it's not true what some Chinese say about girl babies being worthless. It depends on what kind of girl baby you are. In my case, people could see my value. I looked and smelled like a precious bun cake. Sweet, with a good clean color. The matchmaker bragged about me. An earth horse for an earth sheep. This is the best marriage combination. She patted my arm and I pushed her hand away. Huang Tai Tai whispered in her sure, sure voice that perhaps I had an unusually bad pea chi, a bad temper. But the matchmaker laughed and said, not so, not so. She is a strong horse. She will grow up to be a hard worker who serves you well in your old age. And this is when Huang Tai Tai looked down at me with a cloudy face, as though she could penetrate my thoughts and see my future intentions. I will never forget her look. Her eyes opened wide. She searched my face carefully and then she smiled. I could see a large gold tooth staring at me like the blinding sun, and then the rest of her teeth opened wide as if she were going to swallow me down in one piece. This is how I became betrothed to Huang Tai Tai's son, who I later discovered was just a baby, one year younger than I. His name was Tian Yu, Tian for sky, because he was so important, and Yu meaning leftovers, because when he was born, his father was very sick and his family thought he might die. Tian Yu would be the leftover of his father's spirit, but his father lived and his grandmother was scared the ghosts would turn their attention to this baby boy and take him instead. So they watched him carefully, made all his decisions, and he became very spoiled. 
But even if I had known I was getting such a bad husband, I had no choice, now or later. That was how backward families in the country were. We were always the last to give up stupid old-fashioned customs. In other cities already, a man could choose his own wife, with his parents' permission, of course. But we were cut off from this type of new thought. You never heard if ideas were better in another city, only if they were worse. We were told stories of sons who were so influenced by bad wives that they threw their old crying parents out into the street. So, Tai Yuanyi's mothers continued to choose their daughters-in-law, ones who would raise proper sons, care for the old people, and faithfully sweep the family burial grounds long after the old ladies had gone to their graves. Because I was promised to the Huang's son for marriage, my own family began treating me as if I belonged to somebody else. My mother would say to me when the rice bowl went up to my face too many times, Look how much Wang Tai Tai's daughter can eat. My mother did not treat me this way because she didn't love me. She would say this, biting back her tongue, so she wouldn't wish for something that was no longer hers. I was actually a very obedient child, but sometimes I had a sour look on my face, only because I was hot or tired or very ill. This is when my mother would say, Such an ugly face. The Huangs won't want you, and our whole family will be disgraced. And I would cry more to make my face uglier. It's no use, my mother would say. We have made a contract. It cannot be broken. And I would cry even harder. I didn't see my future husband until I was eight or nine. The world that I knew was our family compound in the village outside of Taiyuan. My family lived in a modest two-story house with a smaller house in the same compound, which was really just two side-by-side -side rooms for our cook, an everyday servant, and their families. Our house sat on a little hill, we called this hill Three Steps to Heaven, but it was really just centuries of hardened layers of mud washed up by the Fen River. On the east wall of our compound was the river, which my father said liked to swallow little children. He said it had once swallowed the whole town of Taiyan. The river ran brown in the summer. In the winter, the river was blue-green in the narrow, fast-moving spots. In the wider places, it was frozen still, white with cold. Oh, I can remember the new year when my family went to the river and caught many fish. Giant slippery creatures plucked while they were still sleeping in their frozen riverbeds. So fresh that even after they were gutted, they would dance on their tails when thrown into the hot pan. That was also the year I first saw my husband as a little boy. When the firecrackers went off, he cried loud, wah -ah! with a big open mouth, even though he was not a baby. Later I would see him at red egg ceremonies when one-month-old boy babies were given their real names. He would sit on his grandmother's old knees, almost cracking them with his weight. And he would refuse to eat everything offered to him, always turning his nose away, as though someone were offering him a stinky pickle and not a sweet cake. So I didn't have instant love for my future husband the way you see on television today. I thought of this boy more like a troublesome cousin. I learned to be polite to the Huangs and especially to Huang Tai Tai. My mother would push me toward Huang Tai Tai and say, What do you say to your mother? And I would be confused, not knowing which mother she meant. So I would turn to my real mother and say, Excuse me, Ma. And then I would turn to Huang Tai Tai and present her with a little goodie to eat, saying, For you, mother. I remember it was once a lump of xiu mai, a little dumpling I loved to eat. My mother told Wang Tai Tai I had made this dumpling especially for her, even though I had only poked its steamy sides with my finger when the cook poured it onto the serving plate. My life changed completely when I was twelve, the summer the heavy rains came. The Fen River, which ran through the middle of my family's land, flooded the plains. It destroyed all the wheat my family had planted that year and made the land useless for years to come. Even our house on top of the little hill became unlivable. When we came down from the second story, we saw the floors and furniture were covered with sticky mud. The courtyards were littered with uprooted trees, broken bits of walls, and dead chickens. We were so poor in all this mess. You couldn't go to an insurance company back then and say, 
Somebody did this damage. Pay me a million dollars. In those days, you were unlucky if you had exhausted your own possibilities. My father said we had no choice but to move the family to Wu Xi, to the south near Shanghai, where my mother's brother owned a small flour mill. My father explained that the whole family, except for me, would leave immediately. I was 12 years old, old enough to separate from my family and live with the Huangs. The roads were so muddy and filled with giant potholes that no truck was willing to come to the house. All the heavy furniture and bedding had to be left behind, and these were promised to the Huangs as my dowry. In this way, my family was quite practical. The dowry was enough, more than enough, said my father. But he could not stop my mother from giving me her chang, a necklace made out of a tablet of red jade. When she put it around my neck, she acted very stern, so I knew she was very sad. Obey your family. Do not disgrace us, she said. Act happy when you arrive. Really, you are very lucky. The Huang's house also sat next to the river. While our house had been flooded, their house was untouched. This is because their house sat higher up in the valley, and this was the first time I realized the Huangs had a much better position than my family. They looked down on us, which made me understand why Huang Tai Tai and Tian Yu had such long noses. When I passed under the Huang's stone and wood gateway arch, I saw a large courtyard with three or four rows of small low buildings. Some were for storing supplies, others for servants and their families. Behind these modest buildings stood the main house. I walked closer and stared at the house that would be my home for the rest of my life. The house had been in the family for many generations. It was not really so old or remarkable, but I could see it had grown up along with the family. There were four stories, one for each generation, great-grandparents, grandparents, parents, and children. The house had a confused look. It had been hastily built, and then rooms and floors and wings and decorations had been added on in every which manner, reflecting too many opinions. The first level was built of river rocks, held together by straw-filled mud. The second and third levels were made of smooth bricks with an exposed walkway to give it the look of a palace tower. And the top level had grey slab walls topped with a red tile roof. To make the house seem important, there were two large round pillars holding up a veranda entrance to the front door. These pillars were painted red, as were the wooden window borders. Someone, probably Huang Tai Tai, had added imperial dragon heads at the corners of the roof. Inside, the house held a different kind of pretense. The only nice room was a parlor on the first floor, which the Huangs used to receive guests. This room contained tables and chairs carved out of red lacquer, fine pillows embroidered with the Huang family name in the ancient style, and many precious things that gave the look of wealth and old prestige. The rest of the house was plain and uncomfortable and noisy, with the complaints of twenty relatives. I think with each generation the house had grown smaller inside, more crowded. Each room had been cut in half to make two. No big celebration was held when I arrived. Huang Tai Tai didn't have red banners greeting me in the fancy room on the first floor. Tian Yi was not there to greet me. Instead, Huang Tai Tai hurried me upstairs to the second floor and into the kitchen, which was a place where family children didn't usually go. This was a place for cooks and servants. So I knew my standing. That first day... I stood in my best padded dress at the low wooden table and began to chop vegetables. I could not keep my hands steady. I missed my family, and my stomach felt bad, knowing I had finally arrived where my life said I belonged. But I was also determined to honor my parents' words, so Huang Tai Tai could never accuse my mother of losing face. She would not win that from our family. As I was thinking this, I saw an old servant woman stooping over the same low table gutting a fish, looking at me from the corner of her eye. I was crying and I was afraid she would tell Huang Tai Tai. So I gave a big smile and shouted, What a lucky girl I am! I'm going to have the best life! And in this quick thinking way, I must have waved my knife too close to her nose because she cried angrily, Shama Pantheran! What kind of fool are you? And I knew right away this was a warning, 
because when I shouted that declaration of happiness, I almost tricked myself into thinking it might come true. I saw Tian Yu at the evening meal. I was still a few inches taller than he, but he acted like a big warlord. I knew what kind of husband he would be because he made special efforts to make me cry. He complained the soup was not hot enough and then spilled the bowl as if it were an accident. He waited until I had sat down to eat and then would demand another bowl of rice. He asked why I had such an unpleasant face when looking at him. Over the next few years, Huang Tai Tai instructed the other servants to teach me how to sew sharp corners on pillowcases and to embroider my future family's name. How can a wife keep her husband's household in order if she has never dirtied her own hands, Huang Tai Tai used to say as she introduced me to a new task. I don't think Huang Tai Tai ever soiled her hands, but she was very good at calling out orders and criticism. Teach her to wash rice properly so that the water runs clear. Her husband cannot eat muddy rice, she said to a cook servant. Another time she told the servant to show me how to clean a chamber pot. Make her put her own nose to the barrel to make sure it's clean. That was how I learned to be an obedient wife. I learned to cook so well that I could smell if the meat stuffing was too salty before I even tasted it. I could sew such small stitches it looked as if the embroidery had been painted on. And even Huang Tai Tai complained in a pretend manner that she could scarcely throw a dirty blouse on the floor before it was cleaned and on her back once again, causing her to wear the same clothes every day. After a while, I didn't think it was a terrible life. No, not really. After a while, I hurt so much I didn't feel any different. What was happier than seeing everybody gobble down the shiny mushrooms and bamboo shoots I had helped to prepare that day? What was more satisfying than having Huang Tai Tai nod and pat my head when I had finished combing her hair one hundred strokes? How much happier could I be after seeing Tian Yu eat a whole bowl of noodles without once complaining about its taste or my looks? It's like those ladies you see on American TV these days. The ones who are so happy they have washed out a stain so the clothes look better than new. Can you see how the Huangs almost washed their thinking into my skin? I came to think of Tian Yu as a god, someone whose opinions were worth much more than my own life. I came to think of Wang Tai Tai as my real mother, someone I wanted to please, someone I should follow and obey without question. When I turned 16 on the Lunar New Year, Huang Tai Tai told me she was ready to welcome a grandson by next spring. Even if I had not wanted to marry, where would I go live instead? Even though I was strong as a horse, how could I run away? The Japanese were in every corner of China. The Japanese showed up as uninvited guests, said Chen Yu's grandmother. And that's why nobody else came. Huang Tai Tai had made elaborate plans, but our wedding was very small. She had asked the entire village and friends and family from other cities as well. In those days, you didn't do RSVP. It was not polite not to come. Huang Tai Tai didn't think the war would change people's good manners. So the cook and her helpers prepared hundreds of dishes. My family's old furniture had been shined up into an impressive dowry and placed in the front parlor. Huang Tai Tai had taken care to remove all the water and mud marks. She had even commissioned someone to write felicitous messages on red banners, as if my parents themselves had draped these decorations to congratulate me on my good luck. And she had arranged to rent a red palanquin to carry me from her neighbor's house to the wedding ceremony. A lot of bad luck fell on our wedding day, even though the matchmaker had chosen a lucky day. The fifteenth day of the eighth moon when the moon is perfectly round and bigger than any other time of the year. But the week before the moon arrived, the Japanese came. They invaded Shanxi province, as well as the provinces bordering us. People were nervous. And the morning of the fifteenth, on the day of the wedding celebration, it began to rain. A very bad sign. When the thunder and lightning began, people confused it with Japanese bombs and would not leave their houses. I heard later that poor Huang Tai Tai waited many hours for more people to come, and finally, 
when she could not wring any more guests out of her hands, she decided to start the ceremony. What could she do? She could not change the wall. I was at the neighbor's house when they called me to come down and ride the red palanquin. I was sitting at a small dressing table by an open window. I began to cry and thought bitterly about my parents' promise. I wondered why my destiny had been decided, why I should have an unhappy life so someone else could have a happy one. From my seat by the window, I could see the Fen River with its muddy brown waters. I thought about throwing my body into this river that had destroyed my family's happiness. A person has very strange thoughts when it seems that life is about to end. It started to rain again, just a light rain. The people from downstairs called up to me once again to hurry, and my thoughts became more urgent, more strange. I asked myself, what is true about a person? Would I change in the same way the river changes color but still be the same person? And then I saw the curtains blowing wildly, and outside, rain was falling harder, causing everyone to scurry and shout. I smiled. And then I realized it was the first time I could see the power of the wind. I couldn't see the wind itself, but I could see it carried the water that filled the rivers and shaped the countryside. It caused men to yelp and dance. I wiped my eyes and looked in the mirror. I was surprised at what I saw. I had on a beautiful red dress, but what I saw was even more valuable. I was strong. I was pure. I had genuine thoughts inside that no one could see, that no one could ever take away from me. I was like the wind. I threw my head back and smiled proudly to myself, and then I draped the large embroidered red scarf over my face and covered these thoughts up. But underneath the scarf, I still knew who I was. I made a promise to myself. I would always remember my parents' wishes, but I would never forget myself. When I arrived at the wedding, I had the red scarf over my face, and I couldn't see anything in front of me. But when I bent my head forward, I could see out the sides. Very few people had come. I saw the Huangs, the same old complaining relatives now embarrassed by this poor showing, the entertainers with their violins and flutes, and there were a few village people who had been brave enough to come out for a free meal. I even saw servants and their children, who must have been added to make the party look bigger. Someone took my hands and guided me down a path. I was like a blind person walking to my fate. But I was no longer scared. I could see what was inside me. A high official conducted the ceremony, and he talked too long about philosophers and models of virtue. Then I heard the matchmaker speak about our birth dates and harmony and fertility. I tipped my veil head forward and I could see her hands unfolding a red silk scarf and holding up a red candle for everyone to see. The candle had two ends for lighting. One length had carved gold characters with Tian Yu's name, the other with mine. The matchmaker lighted both ends and announced, The marriage has begun. Tian yanked the scarf off my face and smiled at his friends and family, never even looking at me. He reminded me of a young peacock I once saw that acted as if he had just claimed the entire courtyard by fanning his still short tail. I saw the matchmaker place the lighted red candle in a gold holder and then hold it to a nervous-looking servant. This servant was supposed to watch the candle during the banquet and all night to make sure neither end went out. In the morning, the matchmaker was supposed to show the result, a little piece of black ash, and then declare. This candle burned continuously at both ends without going out. This is a marriage that can never be broken. I still can remember. That candle was a marriage bond that was worth more than a Catholic promise not to divorce. It meant I couldn't divorce and I couldn't ever remarry even if Tian Yu died. That red candle was supposed to seal me forever with my husband and his family. No excuses afterward. And sure enough, the matchmaker made her declaration the next morning and showed she had done her job. But I know what really happened, because I stayed up all night crying about my marriage. After the banquet, our small wedding party pushed us and half-carried us up to the third floor to our small bedroom. 
People were shouting jokes and pulling boys from underneath a bed. The matchmaker helped small children pull red eggs that had been hidden between the blankets. The boys who were about Tian Yu's age made us sit on the bed side by side, and everybody made us kiss so our faces would turn red with passion. Firecrackers exploded on the walkway outside our open window, and someone said this was a good excuse for me to jump into my husband's arms. After everyone left, we sat there side by side without words for many minutes, still listening to the laughing outside. When it grew quiet, Tian Yu said, This is my bed. You sleep on the sofa. He threw a pillow and a thin blanket to me. I was so glad. I waited until he fell asleep, and then I got up quietly and went outside, down the stairs and into the dark courtyard. Outside, it smelled as if it would soon rain again. I was crying, walking in my bare feet and feeling the wet heat still inside the bricks. Across the courtyard, I could see the matchmaker's servant through a yellow-lit open window. She was sitting at a table, looking very sleepy as the red candle burned in its special gold holder. I sat down by a tree to watch my fate being decided for me. I must have fallen asleep, because I remember being startled awake by the sound of loud, cracking thunder. That's when I saw the matchmaker's servant running from the room, scared as a chicken about to lose its head. Oh, she was asleep too, I thought. And now she thinks it's the Japanese. I laughed. The whole sky became light and then more thunder came, and she ran out of the courtyard and down the road, going so fast and hard I could see pebbles kicking up behind her. Where does she think she's running to, I wondered, still laughing. And then I saw the red candle flickering just a little with the breeze. I was not sinking when my legs lifted me up, and my feet ran me across the courtyard to the yellow-lit room. But I was hoping. I was praying to Buddha, the goddess of mercy, and the full moon to make that candle go out. It fluttered a little, and the flame bent down low. But still, both ends burned strong. My throat filled with so much hope that it finally burst and blew out my husband's end of the candle. I immediately shivered with fear. I thought a knife would appear and cut me down dead. Or the sky would open up and blow me away. But nothing happened. And when my senses came back, I walked back to my room with fast, guilty steps. The next morning, the matchmaker made her proud declaration in front of Tian Yu, his parents, and myself. My job is done, she announced, pouring the remaining black ash onto the red cloth. I saw her servant's shame-faced, mournful look. I learned to love Tian Yu, but it is not how you think. From the beginning, I would always become sick, thinking he would someday climb on top of me and do his business. Every time I went into our bedroom, my hair would already be standing up. But during the first months, he never touched me. He slept in his bed. I slept on my sofa. In front of his parents, I was an obedient wife, just as they taught me. I instructed the cook to kill a fresh young chicken every morning and cook it until pure juice came out. I would strain this juice myself into a bowl, never adding any water. I gave this to him for breakfast, murmuring good wishes about his health. And every night I would cook a special tonic soup called tunal, which was not only very delicious, but has eight ingredients that guarantee long life for mothers. This pleased my mother-in-law very much. But it was not enough to keep her happy. One morning, Huang Tai Tai and I were sitting in the same room, working on our embroidery. I was dreaming about my childhood, about a pet frog I once kept named Big Wind. Huang Tai Tai seemed restless, as if she had an itch in the bottom of her shoe. I heard her huffing, and then all of a sudden she stood up from her chair, walked over to me, and slapped my face. Bad wife, she cried. If you refuse to sleep with my son, I refuse to feed you or clothe you. So that's how I knew what my husband had said to avoid his mother's anger. I was also boiling with anger, but I said nothing, remembering my promise to my parents to be an obedient wife. That night, I sat on Tian Yu's bed and waited for him to touch me, but he didn't. I was relieved. The next night, I lay straight down on the bed next to him, and still he didn't touch me. So the next night, 
I took off my gown. That's when I could see what was underneath Tian Yu. He was scared and turned his face. He had no desire for me, but it was his fear that made me think he had no desire for any woman. He was like a little boy who had never grown up. After a while, I was no longer afraid. I even began to think differently towards Tian Yu. It was not like the way a wife loves a husband, but more like a way a sister protects a younger brother. I put my gown back on and lay down next to him and rubbed his back. I knew I no longer had to be afraid. I was sleeping with Tian Yi. He would never touch me and I had a comfortable bed to sleep on. After more months had passed and my stomach and breasts remained small and flat, Huang Tai Tai flew into another kind of rage. My son says he's planted enough seeds for thousands of grandchildren. Where are they? It must be you are doing something wrong. And after that, she confined me to the bed so that her grandchildren's seeds would not spill out so easily. Oh, you think it is so much fun to lie in bed all day, never getting up. But I tell you, it was worse than a prison. I think Huan Tai Tai became a little crazy. She told the servants to take all sharp things out of the room, thinking scissors and knives were cutting off her next generation. She forbade me from sewing. She said I must concentrate and think of nothing but having babies. And four times a day, a very nice servant girl would come into my room, apologizing the whole time while making me drink a terrible-tasting medicine. I envied this girl, the way she could walk out the door. Sometimes, as I watched her from my window, I would imagine I was that girl, standing in the courtyard, bargaining with the traveling shoe mender, gossiping with other servant girls, scolding a handsome delivery man in her high, teasing voice. One day, after two months had gone by without any results, Huang Tai Tai called the old matchmaker to the house. The matchmaker examined me closely, looked up my birth date and the hour of my birth, and then asked Huang Tai Tai about my nature. Finally, the matchmaker gave her conclusions. It's clear what has happened. A woman can have sons only if she is deficient in one of the elements. Your daughter-in-law was born with enough wood, fire, water and earth, and she was deficient in metal, which was a good sign. But when she was married, you loaded her down with gold bracelets and decorations, and now she has all the elements, including metal. She is too balanced to have babies. This turned out to be joyous news for Huang Tai Tai, for she liked nothing better than to reclaim all her gold and jewelry to help me become fertile. And it was good news for me too, because after the gold was removed from my body, I felt lighter, more free. They say this is what happens if you lack metal. You begin to think as an independent person. That day I started to think about how I would escape this marriage without breaking my promise to my family. It was really quite simple. I made the Huangs think it was their idea to get rid of me, that they would be the ones to say the marriage contract was not valid. I thought about my plan for many days. I observed everyone around me the thoughts they showed in their faces. And then, I was ready. I chose an auspicious day, the third day of the third month. That's the day of the festival of pure brightness. On this day, your thoughts must be clear as you prepare to think about your ancestors. That's the day when everyone goes to the family graves. They bring hoes to clear the weeds and brooms to sweep the stones, and they offer dumplings and oranges as spiritual food. Oh, it is not a somber day, more like a picnic, but it has special meaning to someone looking for grandsons. On the morning of that day, I woke up Tian Yu in the entire house with my wailing. It took Wang Tai Tai a long time to come into my room. What's wrong with her now? She cried from her room. Go make her be quiet. But finally, after my wailing didn't stop, she rushed into my room, scolding me at the top of her voice. I was clutching my mouth with one hand and my eyes with another. My body was wreathing as if I was seized by a terrible pain. I was quite convincing, because Huang Tai Tai drew back and grew small like a scared animal. 
What's wrong, little daughter? Tell me quickly, she cried. Oh, it's too terrible to think, too terrible to say, I said between gasps and more wailing. After enough wailing, I said what was so unthinkable. I had a dream, I reported. Our ancestors came to me and said they wanted to see our wedding. So Tian Yu and I held the same ceremony for our ancestors. We saw the matchmaker light the candle and give it to the servant to watch. Our ancestors were so pleased, so pleased. Huang Tai Tai looked impatient as I began to cry softly again. But then the servant left the room with our candle, and a big wind came and blew the candle out. And our ancestors became very angry. They shouted that the marriage was doomed. They said that Tian Yu's end of the candle had blown out. <laughs> Our ancestor said Tian Yu would die if he stayed in this marriage. Tian Yu's face turned white. But Huang Tai Tai only frowned. What a stupid girl to have such bad dreams. And then she scolded everybody to go back to bed. Mother, I called to her in a hoarse whisper. Please don't leave me. I am afraid. Our ancestors said if the matter is not settled, they would begin the cycle of destruction. What is this nonsense? cried Huang Tai Tai, turning back toward me. Tian Yu followed her, wearing his mother's same frowning face, and I knew they were almost caught, two ducks leaning into the pot. They knew you would not believe me, I said in a remorseful tone, because they know I do not want to leave the comforts of my marriage. So our ancestors said they would plant the signs to show our marriage is now <laughs> rotting. <laughs> what nonsense from your stupid head, said Wang Tai Tai, sighing, but she could not resist. What signs? In my dream, I saw a man with a long beard and a mole on his cheek. Tian Yu's grandfather? asked Huang Tai Tai. I nodded, remembering the painting I had observed on the wall. He said there are three signs. First, he has drawn a black spot on Tian Yu's back, and the spot will grow and eat away Tian Yu's flesh, just as it ate away our ancestor's face before he died. <laughs> Huang Tai Tai quickly turned to Tian Yu and pulled his shirt up. hi -ya! She cried, because there it was, the same black mole, the size of a fingertip, just as I had always seen it these past five months of sleeping as sister and brother. And then our ancestors touched my mouth, and I patted my cheek as if it already hurt. He said my teeth would start to fall out one by one until I could no longer protest leaving this marriage. Huang Tai Tai pried open my mouth and gasped upon seeing the open spot in the back of my mouth where a rotted tooth fell out four years ago. And finally, I saw him plant a seed in a servant girl's womb. He said this girl only pretends to come from a bad family, but she is really from imperial blood and... <laughs> I lay my head down on the pillow as if too tired to go on. Huang Tai Tai pushed my shoulder. What does he say? He said the servant girl is Tian Yi's true spiritual wife. And the seed he has planted will grow into Tian Yi's child. By mid-morning, they had dragged the matchmaker's servant over to our house and extracted her terrible confession. And after much searching, they found the servant girl I liked so much, the one I had watched from my window every day. I had seen her eyes grow bigger and her teasing voice become smaller whenever the handsome delivery man arrived. And later, I had watched her stomach grow rounder and her face become longer with fear and worry. So you can imagine how happy she was when they forced her to tell the truth about her imperial ancestry. I heard later she was so struck with this miracle of marrying Tian Yu, she became a very religious person who ordered servants to sweep the ancestors' graves not just once a year, but once a day. There is no more to the story. They didn't blame me so much.
Huang Tai Tai got her grandson, I got my clothes, a rail ticket to Peking, and enough money to go to America. The Huangs asked only that I never tell anybody of any importance about the story of my doomed marriage. It's a true story, how I kept my promise, how I sacrificed my life. See the gold medal I can now wear? I gave birth to your brothers, and then your father gave me these two bracelets. Then I had you. And every few years, when I have a little extra money, I buy another bracelet. I know what I'm worth. There are always twenty-four carats, all genuine. But I will never forget. On the day of the festival of pure brightness, I take of all my bracelets. I remember the day when I finally knew a genuine thought and could follow where it went. That was the day I was a young girl with my face under a red marriage scarf. I promised not to forget myself. How nice it is to be that girl again, to take off my scarf, to see what is underneath, and feel the likeness come back into my body.